machines. All right, here we go. I'm going to talk about output compressing randomized encoding and its application. So it's a very natural progression, as you've seen this morning. Um, I'll tell you what they are. Okay, so randomized encoding, we've seen it's a very beautiful concept that we want to encode a single computation, a complex one, into a simpler computation. Okay? And uh, here I want to stress two points. One is a single computation. What does that mean is that the encoding algorithm needs to take both a deterministic program, which we can think of as either represented in a circuit or in a tooling machine, together with an input. So once these two things are specified, this computation is really determined. There is no like wiggle room or any change. So it's a single computation. And after encoding it, we want to say that um, it satisfies the simplicity requirement. What does that mean is that it's actually much simpler to compute the encoding, to encode the computation, than actually performing the uh, computation itself. And uh, yet still, of course, there is no free lunch. It cannot be that the encoding becomes much easier and we don't have to pay the time for computing the function anymore. So we still have to pay, but this payment is somehow delayed at the time of decoding. Only at the decoding time to actually get the output of the computation, we we'll have to run as long as, or we'll, the computation will have to be as complex as the original computation. And additionally, this encoding needs to satisfy some security requirement. In particular, it needs to hide both the machine and the input. Okay? So for this talk, it will be convenient sometimes to just think about this machine and input as some machine that has the input hard-coded inside. So it's a machine that takes no input at all. Okay? And in particular, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to examine more closely what the simplicity and security mean. So simplicity, as have been mentioned, in the literature mostly means low parallel time complexity or it means low depth computation. And by this beautiful theorem by um, Appelbaum, Ishai, and Kushlevitz, it says that any circuit, polynomial time circuit, can actually be encoded in NC0, in constant parallel time. It's really a beautiful concept and has found many, many applications to different topics in crypto. Uh, for example, MPC, parallel crypto verifiable delegation. And I want to mention that somehow randomized encoding, especially low depth randomized encoding, is very closely related with Gobble circuit. But for some reason, it really kind of, because this concept itself stresses on the simplicity of the encoding, it really brings forward the low depth of the encoding algorithm to the spotlight. And for some reason, this gives a very simple and powerful abstraction, and that enabled a lot of thought process that was not there before when we we're just thinking about Gabo circuit. And I think that's really the beauty of randomized encoding. And of course, there's no particular reason to focus to say simplicity has to equals to low depth. We can think about other measures of simplicity. In fact, they exist in the literature. And today I'm going to focus only on one of them. In particular, it's called simply low encoding time. I just want the time to encode the computation to be much, much smaller than the time to actually perform it. And the first observation we should make is that if I want this, then I cannot think about circuit representation. I must think about the tooling machine representation. Because otherwise, the encoding algorithm to even just read the entire circuit was run, were run as long as the time of the computation. And what I want is really, given a very short tooling machine, the description is small, together with a short input, and for simplicity, let me just think about the total length of them is something bounded by polynomial in the security parameter. I want to say that the encoding algorithm will create an encoding in polynomial time, independent of the running time of the tooling machine. Or alternatively, you can view it as could it depend only polylogarithmically on the running time of the tooling machine. And this seems like a very magic and very powerful thing. And nevertheless, in a recent line of work, we show that we can actually achieve that, assuming very strong assumption, which is sub-exponential I.O. and the one-way function. And by now, you must be saying, of course, magic implies magic. 
<laughs> Indeed, a good point. But nevertheless, I'm going to consider even more magic in this talk. Why are you referring to one with functions as the first one with functions? <laughs> <laughs> even better point. I like that. <laughs> so succinct randomized encoding as also Nier was talking about, is really a very powerful primitive. Now let's just look at it a little bit, think about it for five seconds. We get this very short representation of this computation. The encoding algorithm runs polynomial time in the length of the description. In other words, it cannot in any way attempt to try to compute this function at all. Okay? It must take the description bit by bit as is and produce this encoding to hide it. Yet, the encoding need to be able to produce the entire output. So it seems that it's really kind of something optimal. Is the case? It's not the case. There's a caveat until you kind of look deeply into those recent works. Is that they are considered Boolean tooling machine. Okay? Well, a Boolean tooling machine or non-Boolean tooling machine, why do I care? It's without loss of generality. Why? Because if I take a general Turing machine with long output, I can just think about encoding those Boolean Turing machines that outputs each output bit one at a time. And if I encode them separately, I can apply this succinct randomized encoding. Except that now the time for encoding will scale linearly with the length of the output. Okay. Suddenly it's not so optimal anymore. Why? Because well, there could exist a Turing machine that outputs, its output is, say, a constant fraction of its uh, running time. And that means that the randomized encoding or the entire encoding itself will have to be even longer. Okay. So there's room to even improve it. And this is the focus of this work. We want to look at whether we can have output compressing randomized encoding. In other words, I wonder, can we encode a computation in time that's even short, shorter than its output? Okay? And for general non Boolean Turing machines, we're going to call this randomized encoding, a uh, call randomized encoding compact if the encoding time is polynomial independent of running time and the output length. Or I can consider slightly weaker notion, which we call sublinear randomized encoding, where the encoding will still scale with the running time, but polynomially, with the sublinear polynomial dependency. OK. So with such efficiency requirement, now you can see that there really exist those Turing machine computation where the output is really, really long. And in, po in particular, the output is going to be much, much longer than the encoding itself. Okay? That could exist. We, there could also exist the Turing machine, which is just Boolean. Then there is no, the encoding is going to be longer. But there could exist a Turing machine that outputs really long string. And the output is going to be longer than the encoding itself. That's why the name output compressing. All right. So that sounds like even more magic. Why not? We can do succinct. Why not do compact, right? And um, the compact is better than succinct. I just want to make sure. Yes, succinct means the means scaling with the run, with the output length. Okay. Compact means it doesn't scale or scale sublinearly with the output length. If you're compact, you're also succinct. Exactly. Uh, if you're compact, you're definitely succinct. But uh, sublinear RE is something that's on the side. All right. For non Boolean Turing machines, if you just have one, what you wrote compact and succinct is identical thing, right? It's just, so you're trying to separate Boolean or non Boolean or something. Exactly. Like that. But, but for non Boolean, you have one definition. I mean, ignoring for sublinear. Boolean. For Boolean, they're the same. For Boolean Turing machine, succinct the compact means the same thing because the output is only one bit. However, for non-Boolean Turing machine, succinct randomized encoding is going to grow with the length of the output, whereas compact randomized encoding, the length will not grow with the length of the output. About one particular construction, but for definition, definition is the same. So if I write the definition 
Like, I don't talk about Boolean. There is only non Boolean. allow it to grow and compact doesn't. It's not a same definition. Thank you. So, um, so I could write it in the following form. Succinct means the runtime is poly in security parameter, log of running time, and length of the output. Compact means poly in n, log of t without the output. Yes? Yeah? Say obfuscation because interesting about the long output is like a truth table and your data right, just right. I'm going to go into it. Yeah. All right. So do do people now agree this is something stronger than succinct uh, randomized encoding? Okay, great. So, so let me move on. I have lots of sl slides. All right. <laughs> So first the thing is that, wait a minute, this thing is very nice, but how about security? We want security after all. Immediately you will notice if the length of the encoding is smaller than the, if the encoding is shorter than output, there's no way that we can hope to get simulation-based security. <coughs> Why? Because I can think about the output as something that is incompressible, like a pseudo-random string, then a simulator cannot compress this pseudo-random string into a short encoding that will expand to it. Therefore, it is necessary that we have to look at other types of security notion, in particular indistinguishability based ones. What's the most natural, the first thought that comes into mind? Well, we call it weak indistinguishability security, is that if I have a pair of computation and they have the same output, identical output, and for now let me just think about both of the machines will have the same running time upper bound, then I want the encoding to be indistinguishable. Okay. A very natural weakening of the simulation-based security. And as you can guess, since I'm calling this the weak indistinguishability security, so there must be a stronger one. Okay. The stronger one that we also study in this paper is called the distributional indistinguishability security. What it requires is that uh, what if I don't want the output to be exactly identical? I, I want to say relax a little bit to say the output are only indistinguishable to each other. Then I still want the encodings to be indistinguishable. Indistinguishable given what side information? Exactly. So uh, no no side information. Okay, just the output. So wait. So if I know, is it right? Can I know the Turing machine? Let me get into, into that. Exactly. So first of all, as uh, Anna is pointing out, the first thing is that those machines are deterministic. What does it mean that output are indistinguishable? They're either equal or non-equal, okay? So therefore, that's why it's called distributional. The machines are sampled themselves from two distributions. And when they're sampled from the distribution and evaluated, they, they give indistinguishable output. Okay, seems like also, um, Meaningful definition to consider, yeah? It should be M prime X prime. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, M prime X prime, thank you. You could also have considered a randomized M. To yes. How does it relate to that? If I consider randomized M, it will be a different notion, and in particular, I don't know whether it's implied by simulation security. On the other hand, this notion, which considered deterministic but distributional machines, it's actually implied by simulation security. Okay, so as the notion itself, it seems uh, more reasonable. Okay. But the power of it, I suspect, is very similar with consider a randomized M. Okay. How, how do you even define randomized M? The encoding should allow you to sample from the distribution of X. Uh, you could consider two um, randomized machines that have the property that when you run them, they, they produce they're like two distributions, basically. I'm even talking about the, the how the correctness is defined for randomized. I mean, the encoding will allow right. you to run it on it's, like the sample. Yeah, it's complicated. I'm not defining it as a matter of fact. I'm defining the distributional one. And good reasons why I didn't go that route. Okay. All right, so with this weaker security notion now, the question come back alive. Can compact or sublinear RE exist? Okay. And even before we go there, other than the fact that it seems like a natural extension over succinct ones, I want to note that there is actually a very natural 
kind of relation between obfuscation and randomized encoding. And to see this connection, allow me to now go to a higher level of, of abstraction without thinking about whether it's tooling machine or circuit, compact or succinct, so on and so forth. Just look at these two notions from above high. Okay? So obfuscation is about encoding a computation, but still allow, it, allow us to use it multiple times by evaluating lots of input. Whereas randomized encoding is really a one-time use because the input is fixed. So in some sense, you can view randomized encoding as kind of a degenerated uh, obfuscation. How do I degenerate it? I fix the input. Or you could equivalently think about RE's uh, obfuscation for those Turing machines that have no input at all. Okay? Therefore, all, we, all, all these like different notions of security for randomized encoding nicely corresponds to security notions of obfuscation. For example, the indistinguishability security, the weak one, corresponds one-to-one to, one to indistinguishability of obfuscation. Whereas the simulation security will correspond one-to-one to one with the VBB of obfuscation. So the natural question is, is there a correspondence with this distributional version? Actually, there is. It was corresponding to what we call a puncturable I.O. Don't think about it as a new notion. It's just a way to understand the different notions. What is a puncturable I.O.? It's basically I.O., whereas I.O. is for those machines that are completely functionally equivalent. But puncturable I.O. is for those machines that are equivalent everywhere except one point. And on that point, the output are indistinguishable. So this is actually has been used again and again in our applications of I.O. This is closely related with this punctured program paradigm. And as Sahai and Waters have shown in their beautiful work that for circuits, puncturable I.O. and I.O. are the same thing. Okay? And if you look at puncturable I.O. and degenerated by fixed one input, you get precisely the distribution notion of indistinguishability security. Okay. X is known or X is not known when you put X is known. X is something everybody knows. It's a public. So if M1 of X is indistinguishable from F2 of X, then it's an equal limit, right? Uh, but they're sampled from a distribution. But X is fixed. Sample sub X. So X is fixed. X is fixed, oh, yes. So but the machine are not fixed. Machine are sampled from the distribution. They just disagree on one point. I see. And the machine, so in this indistinguishability, the machines are also output or the machines are not output? There is some no. secret randomness or there is some secret randomness? The there machines are output, then of course it's not. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So, secret, okay. so I'm only comparing the output distribution without the machines. Okay. Otherwise, it's easily distinguishable. Yeah. All right. So this is kind of a nice comparison between uh, fascination and randomized encoding. And this comparison holds if I consider both circuit representation in both sides, as well as if I consider tooling machine representation at both sides. So if I think about tooling machine obfuscation, it will correspond precisely nicely with our compact RE. Okay? And therefore now, we can play around with it. We already know that simulation-based compact RE cannot exist because encoding is too short. So equivalently, we also already know way before that the VBB for tooling machine doesn't exist. To a very simple counterexample. Sorry, is it supposed to be obvious why the punctable IO generates this distributional thing? I, I don't see. It. I don't know. Because you can just basically think about the only input for M1, M2 is X. By fixing, by fixing the input, I fix the input to be X. Uh, I think about the two machines that are zero everywhere else except on X. And on X. Yeah. All right, so for IO, because we know IO for Turing machine exists, therefore degenerated, you will already know compact RE with weak indistinguishability security also exists. Well, that's good news. We know some kind of compactness can exist if you believe in I.O. But so far, I don't know whether this distributional version would exist or not. It's a slightly stronger notion which sits between something which is impossible and something that is possible. I don't know where it will go. Okay? 
On the other hand, perhaps an even bigger problem, a more ambitious problem is that, well, I.O. is kind of a very degenerated version. Oh, randomized encoding is a very degenerated version, but is it possible that this, I can go from the degenerated version to the full of fascination? Okay. Some arrow from the other side. Okay. So, in this work, surrounding the first question of possibility and impossibility, we show both positive and negative results. On one hand, if we just assume sub-exponential one-way function, it turns out that compact RE, I'm going to assume by default it has the distributional indistinguishability security, cannot exist for general distributions. Okay? And uh, I want to point out the first impossibility assumes much stronger assumption, and it was pointed out to us by Nir Betansky and Omer Panath. And then later we weakened the assumption to sub-exponential uh, sub one-way function only. So in particular, it does have a consequence with this comparison with I.O. It means that puncturable I.O. for tooling machine do not exist for general distribution. It means that if we're puncturing a program, and somehow the output is indistinguishable on the punctured point, then your program has to be as long as the output. It cannot be shorter than the output. General distributions mean general efficiently simple distributions, right? Uh, yes. And the next is that nevertheless, we still want the possibility. So to get possibility, we need to circumvent impossibility. Means that either I have to leave the nice word of the plane model, which we do show that if I consider a CRS model, then actually functional encryption, full power functional encryption, will give us this compact or sublinear RE in the CRS model. And in fact, in the CRS model, we can even get simulation security. In the CRS, what is the length of the? As long as the computation. As long? As the computation. So actually, I'm still processing the, the corollary there. What is it? Why did you say it? Cool. Um, because puncturable, um, because compact RE with this security notion is a degeneration of puncturable I.O. So puncturable I.O. would imply this notion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because we had a cross here, therefore we will have a cross here. Okay. And as you will also see that there is a nice difference between circuit and tooling machine because for circuit puncturable I.O. actually exists because it's the same as I.O. itself. Whereas for tooling machine it cannot exist, assuming just one way function. Wait, you, can you throw away the CRS and use it on the motor? I, th I think I can in the... Um, if I assume I.O. I don't know if I can if I don't assume I.O. Okay. okay. Whether I can replace the CRS with a random oracle. So basically whether CRS is a URS, I guess. Yeah. And I also, I guess I'd like to go back to the again. So this, the first result that I.O. obfuscation implies weak in security compactory, is that something that you've already showed and I just blinked? Or was it that? It's just a very trivial, it's a very trivial observation. I can tell you afterwards, okay. yeah. So it's clear that CRS has to be as long as computation because otherwise... Uh... No, I think in the random oracle model, if I assume I.O., I can make the CRS as long as the output, precisely the length of the output. No random oracle, I'm just saying, is it clear that for Ethereum 2, CRS has to be as long as a computation? No, no. I don't know. I. I you, I think uh, Vinod can answer this question. Basically, the CRS is the secret key of the functional encryption. So can, can we make the functional encryption secret key shorter than uh, the computation time? Yeah. yeah, you can. You can. Okay, yeah, then. All right, so I need to move on. So there are basically two ways to circumvent the impossibility. One is to leave the plane model. Assume a CRS, yes, we can do that. The other way is that impossibility rules out for general distributions. Nevertheless, in applications, we can still hope that maybe certain applications only require the security to hold for some specific nice distribution. 
Okay. Actually, both options for circumventing the impossibility result will be very useful for us. In our attempt of going back from one time use to multiple time use, to so assume sub-exponential one-way function, we can actually show that this randomized encoding in the CRS model, nevertheless, is very powerful already. And itself could imply I.O. for circuit or for bounded length, bounded input tooling machine. If we're willing to assume something a little bit more, which is still inside the plane model, but compact randomized encoding for some very nice distribution, which I will tell you about later, then we can actually go one step further to even the fast gating tooling machine with unbounded input length. And closely related with our result is the two recent work by uh, Nabishek and uh, Prabhanjan, as well as uh, Vinod and uh, uh, Nier, where they show that functional encryption implies I.O. And if you still remember in the previous slide, I said that functional encryption will give us RE in the CRS model. Therefore, you put theorem 2 and theorem 3 together. It basically gives an alternative proof to their result. But we consider our proof to be simpler. You're all going to be our judges. And the second I want to point out that already in Abhishek and the Prabhanjan's work, they considered the compact RE. And in fact, by a very simple combination, we can turn a compact RE into a functional encryption using LWE. Okay? What that means is that Existentially, we already know that we can go from one time use to multiple time use through the route of functional encryption. However, I consider our work, um, our, our proof, I believe, somehow brings more insight into the relation between those two without going through this uh, not so complicated but still more complex notion of functional encryption. And additionally, just for the second bullet, is that I.O. for unbounded input tooling machine was previously constructed under strong extractability assumption, namely public coin DIO and the public coin SNARKs. Okay? And this is kind of the first work that we do not need to assume kind of extractability uh, assumption. All right. Uh, can you remind me, uh, do, do you have candidates for compact RE? Uh, yes. What is the nice distribution? Um, KLW. Sorry, what? KLW. KLW give a con uh, like a, gives a candidate for compact RE. So the nice distribution, I'm going to tell you in more uh, detail later. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. So, so, so it gives the candidate for compact RE, which is uh, which assuming I/O for circuits. Yeah. Wait. So, so the, the theorem here says. But it's a candidate. I don't know how to prove it. Yes. <coughs> yes. You asked me for a candidate, so I tell you a candidate. <laughs> I anticipated this question. Okay. So in the next, I'm going to try to first tell you about this nice relation between one-time use and multiple-time use. And then in particular, to make my life simpler, I'm going to prove to you something much more weaker than the full power of the theorem, which says that ignore the impossibility result for a second. Suppose that I really have compact RE in the plane model. Can I get I.O. for some bounded length input to the machine, and bit length? Yeah? So in the positive result for going from FE to uh, compact of the linear RE, uh, do you need public key FE or just security is sufficient? I have to think about it. Right now we use the public key. Hmm. All right. But I know where you're coming from. I talk about it. All right. So already to prove this proposition, it's not obvious. Why? Because it still follows from this paradigm from one time use to multiple time use from something much weaker to something much stronger. But this is not the first time that we encounter this in cryptography. Why? Because we've already done this before. We know how to construct a PRF from a PRG where one is multi-time multi use, the other one is one time. Okay? 
And in, in particular, there's a very nice correspondence in terms of compactness. Why? Because the PRG, the seed, is compact, okay? independent of the length of the expanded pseudorandom output. How did, how did the GGM do that? Well, by trees. So this is what we're going to try to mimic, by trees. Okay? So think about the tree. In order to obfuscate the Turing machine M, I'm going to create this virtual tree, which is something in the mind, that has depths the same as the length of the input. Okay. And we're going to associate with each node in this tree a randomized encoding, an encoding of some computation. Let me tell you what they are. Look at the leaves. Each of the leaves has an index corresponding to precisely one input. For one leaf, its randomized encoding is going to be encoding the tooling machine itself together with the input corresponding to the leaf. What that means is that if I evaluate this encoding, I will get the output of the computation on that particular input. OK, great. How about the internal node? Let me look at one node U that has child V and W. This node is going to have a randomized encoding of some function that satisfies that when I evaluate this encoding, it's going to generate the encoding of the two children. Okay. If you care about knowing what that function is, basically this function is going to be recursively defined where the function is going to run the randomized encoding algorithm, encoding the function corresponding to its children using some PRF random string. That's it. And this, we defined a randomized encoding for every node in a tree. Our obfuscation is simply going to be the encoding for the root, the root encoding. The first thing to notice is that well, this obfuscation is very compact. Why? Because our RE is compact. It's very strong. It's always polynomial size. So in the end, the root is also polynomial size. How do I evaluate? Well, exactly, we mimic the PRF construction. If I want to evaluate an input x, I'm going to take my root encoding and evaluate to get its two children and evaluate again. Basically, I evaluate every encoding on the path going to the input x. And eventually, I evaluate the leaf encoding that will produce me the output. So what is the base of the induction? I'm confused. So this base, I mean, you cannot compute, right? Uh, oh, so let me just go to the, what do you mean a base I cannot compute? Well, you define something recursively that has to be a base of the, you know, the base. The base is this. The base is the computation of the fast-gated program itself evaluated on a specific input. Oh, I see, because that's yeah. a dependent by assumption. Yeah, the base is defined. OK. How about security? Well, security, in order to show security, we want to show that if we're considering two machines that are functionally equivalent, I want to show that their obfuscation, which are basically the root encoding corresponding to those two machines, are indistinguishable. Okay? And I'm going to give a proof by induction. Okay? I don't want you to do that. And my induction hypothesis is that encoding, every encoding on a particular layer uh, at the bottom, on layers at the bottom, are indistinguishable. Okay? So how does the security go? I'll start by examining the leaves. Okay, and look at the one particular node in the leaf. Well, notice that no matter it's an encoding corresponding to M1 or M2, since M1 and M2 are functionally equivalent, they have the same output on input X. Therefore, this encoding corresponding to two computations with identical outputs, and definitely they're going to be indistinguishable. Once I have that, I go up the layers, uh, not backwards. And if I look at one node at the upper layer, I've already proven that the encodings at the layer below, which is the encoding of the node's children, are indistinguishable. Therefore, now I crucially rely on the distribution of indistinguishability security to conclude that the parent encoding is also indistinguishable. And that's it. You can go up and up and up, up until you reach the root. So if you don't have compact RE, 
but something that's slightly engulfs, you could still get something meaningful out of Yeah, so we can deal with sublinearity. It's in the next slide. Oh, in the next few slides, yeah. And QED, that's it, okay? And it's a very simple proof. All right. So the nice thing about looking at this tree in particular is that it allows us to like kind of extend to the version with unbounded input to the machine really easily, just like the PRF, GGM PRF tree. How the goal here is I want to not limit the length of the input to the Turing machine to be some fixed n, and I want to allow to evaluate with arbitrary polynomial length input, just like a Turing machine without any security. And to do that, we're going to thinking about a virtual tree that has even extended length, the depth, which is some super polynomial. And now, if I want to evaluate a particular polynomial length input, it's going to land in some internal node in my tree instead of a leaf. And my goal is still to evaluate it by evaluating the encoding or along the path that leading to the node X. But so far, it's no good. Why? Because even if I get the encoding for x, I don't get anything from the previous construction, because all that I get is to be able to get the encoding of its children. But this can be easily fixed by changing the encoding at x to compute something additional, which is itself an encoding that allows us to actually evaluate the machine on input x. In other words, now my tree is going to look something like this. It's going to become a trinary tree, where each of the nodes will have a dangling leaf, which corresponding to an encoding that ends. Okay. So it's now like a Christmas tree with some ornament on it. Okay. This is all very nice. I like it very much, except when, yeah? So the time to obfuscate is, a, is a super poly, right? Uh, the time to obfuscate is still poorly because I only need to compute the root encoding. There is some technicality one needs to handle, um, but I don't want to go into the detail here. Yeah. Okay, but that's all kind of uh, a dream because after all, I showed you there's no compact RE in general. So what do we say here? Okay, so we have two ways out of the impossibility without one is going to the CRS model. If you want to go to the CRS model, it's really easy to fix the proof, which is we're going to publish a CRS for each of the layer. And now my fascination is going to include both the root encoding together or the CRSs. And if you actually plug in our construction of uh, RE in the CRS model, you'll really see a correspond one-to-one -one with the construction of uh, um, BV and AJ. Okay. And additionally, as uh, Bunny was pointing out, that I don't really need the encodings to be so, so compact. In fact, the sublinear compact is enough. Except I lose a little bit. I won't get I.O. for Turing machine, but I will get I.O. for circuits. And this is without loss of a gener generality by KLW14 that it will still give me back I.O. for bounded input Turing machine fascination. Okay. However, this method is never going to extend to unbounded input of fascination. Why? Because, I mean, I have to publish a CRS for each layer. So when the number of layers is super polynomial, as our nice Christmas tree, then I can't deal with CRS. Yeah? In the previous slide, with the CRS, those are like the secret keys? Is that how it corresponds to the other construction? Uh, I don't need secret keys. Actually, we we actually need public keys. Actually, so you're asking uh, how do does the CRS associate with the encoding? So the encoding algorithm is going to use some public key associated with the CRS. So you can think about the CRS as a very long string together with a public key. You say it corresponds to the constructions of Abhishek and Vinod and everybody else. So. In the when I plug in the functional encryption construction, it's going to correspond to the public key of the functional encryption together with the secret key, secret key. for some function. Yeah. And it's going to be precisely secret key like uh, how they defined it. Yeah? So when you use this to get I.O. for bounded input Turing machines, do you still need complexity leveraging? Uh, yeah. We are sort of using complexity leveraging when we did the induction for the proof, right? So how do we get around that? Well, the key observation here is that 
to enable this paradigm, I'm really looking at the program that we are computing and coding for are really from some very specific distribution, which are quite nice. What they are, either at the leaf, we're at the leaf where we're encoding programs that are functionally equivalent, truly functionally equivalent. Or we are at some internal node where we're encoding some function which computes basically encodings of encodings of encodings of encodings recursively of some machine which are truly functionally equivalent. And therefore, this sum up together to our theorem three that R in CRS give us IO for bounded input to the machine and R E for some nice distribution give me IO for unbounded input to the machine. Okay, so how am I doing with respect to time? <laughs> you have 25 minutes of it. No, no, we're going to start it later. But, uh, yeah. I'm 10 minutes over? You're doing fine. Yeah. Okay, so I can skip the impossibility doubt and then we can just <laughs> conclude. Let's say we can run to the end time at the first day. What about that? Then? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's sure. Five, yeah, three, two, one. 30, so five minutes. Are you sure? Six. Okay. Fine, let's not waste time, okay. <laughs> All right, so let me tell you briefly. I mean, I guess I'm creating enough suspense that this is something nice, and why would it be impossible? Okay. All right, so the impossibility says just assume one way function. I can actually rule out sublinear RE, just RE that's slightly compressing of its output. So we're going to uh, prove this using two steps. In the first step, I'm going to assume one-way function is something else, which is I.O. for circuits. And assume that I can already rule out sublinear RE. Well, the nice thing is that already I have proven to you in theorem three that sublinear RE itself implies I.O. for circuit. So as I have nicely aligned those two lines, you combine them together, you will see that I don't really need the assumption of I.O. for circuit. So just assume one-way function, we can rule out sublinear RE. Okay, so let me now focus on step one. So recall that to show that there is no general sublinear RE, recall what is the security definition. What I want is that if I have outputs from, of machines from some distribution, their outputs are indistinguishable, then I want their encodings to be indistinguishable. Okay? So to create an impossibility doubt, what I want to do is that I want to create those distributions such that their outputs are indistinguishable. However, their encoding, no matter what sublinear randomized encoding algorithm you're using, are just blatantly distinguishable. Okay. If I can do that, then I'm done. And I'm going to do that assuming I.O. So our construction is going to, for now, forget about input. I just think about the machines that always take only input zero. I create two distributions of those machines, and they will have some pseudo-random seed hard-coded inside, S and K. Okay? And what do those machines do? The machine MB is going to produce two things in its output. One is the expanded pseudo-random string, and the other is the IO obfuscation of some program. What does this program do? This program basically verifies whether this pseudorandom string Y has low Kolmogorov complexity. It means that it's going to take an input, and it checks whether this input is short and expands to Y. If that's the case, it's going to output something meaningful, which is B. If it's not, it's just like, well, not meaningful, but. Okay? So as you can see, the observation is that if we have, if, if someone gets the output, okay, and if that person has a short representation of Y, then he can really run this obfuscation to recover B. And therefore he can distinguish whether this output is produced by M0 or M1. And in fact, this is more or less the only thing that you can do in order to distinguish those output distributions. So this is kind of equivalent to each other. Now, our job is basically done. Look at these two distributions of machines if someone is only getting the output. Because the Y is a pseudo-random string, it should be really hard to find a short representation for it. 
Therefore, it will be hard to recover B or to distinguish. Therefore, output distribution are indistinguishable. If someone gets a randomized encoding, then the story is different because this adversary can first evaluate the randomized encoding to get the output. And now, nicely, the encoding itself is a short re representation of Y. Therefore, he can just run this obfuscation with the encoding itself as the input to recover B and distinguish. And that's uh, proof. I think I don't need the full six minutes. And that's more or less all what I want to say. So where did you use the sub-exponential assumption? Oh, I used the sub-exponential one-way function in order to say. So this, um, the, the counter example I just showed use I.O. Okay? Our eventual result does not rely on I.O. The reason is that with sub-exponential one-way function, I can go from, yeah. So in conclusion that I hope I convinced you that this output compressing randomized encoding is highly related with the fascination itself. And if you think about it, as Vika was pointing out already, that it, it's really kind of very similar. Why? Because here I have an encoding that expands out to a very long output. On the other hand, what's the fascination? I have an encoding of a machine that expands out to the entire truth table of the function with some input, okay? So th there are really similar things, and somehow we're saying that even though this is much weaker, because the entire string is a polynomial length and it doesn't take any input in particular, still, nevertheless, you can go back to a fascination. You can do so either through the notion of functional encryption by the paper of AJ and the BV, or you can go it actually directly just using a tree, very simple. And in some sense, uh, that tells us if we want to get a fascination, we have to come up with ways to encode our computation shorter than its output. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Maybe just high level, I haven't thought about it. So, how does CRS? I mean, I, I can kind of see maybe how long CRS helps you, but if the CRS is short, can't you just include it as part of your randomized encoding? Yeah, so the CRS is not short. The CRS is actually long. You said that you can do, you can do a short one. Oh, I see. As long as the output is in the short one. But, 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 I so, so, you, so I guess the, the CRS can be as long as the output length. Can only grow the width. You can do it proportional to the output length. Uh, each, yeah. Like compressing below output length is something we seem to, it seems like a barrier. So CRS right now. To some kind of offline complexity which you don't count as a length but it's kind of in the sky? Is that, that's a cheating? Or to see what's on that's there. right. You can wait that way. Oh, it is programmable? Okay, so let's thank the uh, uh, right